acknowledged the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land which we're gathered on today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about technology and politics. I'm not gonna take up too much of your time. I know that your heads are all swimming from all of this new information about distributed tracing and understand maps and archaeology now. It's been a, <laughs> it's been a, a, a very eventful conference. Uh, so as an introduction, I'm Mary McLeod. Uh, I'm, a, I'm basically from New Zealand, um, so I'm a, a dual citizen um, between New Zealand and Australia, which uh, is very funny um, if you follow Australian politics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I have ancestry in New Zealand with uh, Ngāti Rokawa in the, the South Waikato and um, I'm living in Melbourne at the moment. Currently um, doing a fellowship with Code for Australia, uh, doing some interesting things with bushfire risk forecasting. Uh, so I didn't come out of school intent on being a developer. My first run at higher education was political science, uh, but I gave up, uh, skipped the country, Tried again and gave up again. I love this stuff. But in high school, I got really into postmodernism and I lost faith in the value of words and ideas and I had a lot of existential crises. So, so I went into tech instead. It seemed a lot more practical and gave me different types of crises. Uh, so I've been working with or around Ruby for about five years, been meddling around with the community for about that long as well. Uh, as was mentioned, I've um, ran the, uh, along with friends and, and co-conspirators, have run events like uh, Kiwi Ruby uh, last year in, in Wellington and uh, rail schools and that kind of thing there as well. Um, but I've continued to be passionate about politics. As anyone who's worked with me or had a late night and passion debate at a rails camp or sat next to me at a dinner party or walked past me in the street uh, <laughs> can attest to. Uh, I've continued to have a lot of hot takes about politics. I've written some mildly popular tweets and an essay called Mean Girls and the Australian Labour Party. Um, but you can't read it because it's an unpublished medium draft. Although maybe I'll take some inspiration from Elena and, and release that to the world. Although I think it's a little bit late for it to be a very hot take anymore. Uh, I was also a middling high school debater. And one thing that I learned was to start off by defining your terms. So first definition, technology. Technology is things that people make to do stuff. <laughs> Eleanor gave a much better definition of this yesterday. Uh, <laughs> well, more eloquent. Uh, so about the roots of the word technology. So uh, there's the ancient Greek techne, which means uh, skill with uh, art or craft, and, um, and logos, which is the study or collection of knowledge. Uh, people love to make things, to do stuff. We make physical things to do physical stuff. We make digital things to do digital stuff. We make things that sort of bridge the gap between physical and digital, like the, um, uh, the printer earlier today. We make stuff that helps us do things faster and easier and we make stuff, make things to do all of the stuff for us. As technologists, we should be pretty familiar with this. But today I'm talking about something that most of us don't do professionally or don't intentionally do professionally, politics. Politics is how we organize people and power. Again, there are more complicated definitions around. Some emphasize that it's about making group decisions. Some identify the group negotiation of values. But generally, the common theme is that politics happens when there's a group of people and power needs to be distributed in some way. Anywhere that there are people, there's politics. This operates at all of the different levels that people are organized in. There are international politics, through governments at federal, state, and local levels and there are politics in our workplaces, in our families, and in our communities. To do that organizing, we have political systems, 
the overarching ways in which we organise the people in power in our society. So, for example, in Australia, we'd refer to that as repre uh, representative, re uh, representative democracy. We have political institutions, which define the rules and operations of these systems, things like political parties and electoral laws, uh, and they change and evolve over time. And we have political drama, which happens when there are struggles between different people. Uh, Kevin Rudd is uh, Regina George there. This is the Australian Labour Party on a film, the film, film Mean Girls. It's, it's pretty niche. <laughs> with uh, the organisation of people in power in, in any of the smaller societies like our workplaces or, or our code base, you know, uh, our open source communities, Ruby or Rails or um, our community organisations. We have systems which are enforced by institutions and we have dramas when there are power struggles between people who have different ideas about how institutions or systems should be operated or implemented. And it's the thing that I want to talk about mostly today is those ideas, those ideas that people fight over. They inform the systems, the institutions, and the drama. Political ideas are abstractions of how society is and how it should be. The world is really big, messy, and complicated. But humans are pretty good at seeing patterns and big, messy, complicated things and turning them into general rules. It's a lot of what we do as developers. For example, if you're Thomas Hobbes, which I appreciate none of you are, <laughs> uh, but, so, but if you were, uh, you look at the chaos of 17th century London and Paris and the English Civil War and you make a general rule that people tend inherently towards anarchy. And you follow from there that there should be a strong central authority in order for people to flourish. If you're Karl Marx, you look at the upheaval of the 19th century industrial revolution, you look at the factories, you read a lot of Hegel, and you make a general rule <laughs> that the interests of different classes are irreconcilable. And you follow on from there that the workers should seize the means of production and so on and so on. Uh, this is from a <laughs> Marxist memes for something memes uh, page. There's much better communist memes on the internet than there are Hobbesian memes, although I did find a page called Hobbesian memes for authoritarian teens. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think it's a little bit dated. <laughs> I hope that this aids in your understanding of the different viewpoints of... <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, people make rules about how the world is based on what they see and experience. Ideas about how the world should be are based on those rules about how the world is. So the best possible society is irreconcilably different for Hobbes and Marx, or for the members of those two different Facebook groups. <laughs> the funny thing is that if you trust in other people's experiences, you can engage with any of these abstractions and be like, ah, huh, yeah, that's reasonable. Even when they reach totally different conclusions. An international relations lecturer that I had once at uh, the University of Queensland warned us that over the course of being introduced to a different ideological framework each week, we'd come out of each lecture convinced that it was the best possible description of the world, whether it was liberalism or realism or Marxist-Leninism or whatever else. And it was true. Each framework defined a very convincing view of the world and a very thorough criticism of each other set of ideas. <laughs> Thank you, Sal. <laughs> Hope you all like take this to other conferences as well. <laughs> Might really confuse people. <laughs> we all hold many political ideas, some of which are contradictory. The world is so complicated, and 
we are so good as humans at selectively ignoring and forgetting things that don't fit what we're looking for, that we can believe quite a lot of different things. And if we never really examine our beliefs, we just sort of end up with a mishmash of rules that we've absorbed, some of which are contradictory. So people's actions are informed by their idea of how things should be. Actions that include making things to do stuff, that is building technology. Technology is political because technology is human. You can't keep politics out of technology because it's always already there. It's embedded in the way that we do things. And I think a lot of the other uh, presentations over the last two days have, have been on the topic of, of technology being human. The first way that technology is political, technological change is enabled by political power. Technology is created within human societies. It requires resources to create, and it requires societal power to distribute. Resource distribution is mediated by power, and power distribution is determined by political systems. Massive technological changes can happen when there is political will to distribute resources towards it. For example, the Second World War drove arguably the single greatest uh, leap forward of technology ever. Computers were basically created in order to aim bombs more quickly, and cryptography was massively improved in order to communicate with allies about killing people without the people that they were trying to kill uh, listening in, and obviously nukes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> On a smaller scale, uh, the power distribution in every software project determines what's built. So Matt's nice and he listens to people, but Ruby, kind of, kind of a dictatorship, uh, the power to determine what Ruby is what goes into it, at the end of the day, is down to the specific person with specific viewpoints. Uh, likewise in Rails with DHH. Uh, the way that people in power are organized determines what gets resources, what gets blocked, and what gets distributed. <coughs> Technology is made of ideas about how the world is, and how the world should be. Technology is made by people, and people are made of ideas. We're also made of bones and <laughs> blood. <laughs> we get our ideas all over everything that we touch. We just can't help it. And if we have big ideas that seem important, creating technology <coughs> can be a great way to make them real. So for example, blockchain, it's based on the idea that we shouldn't have to trust a central authority, made and promoted by people with quite specific ideas about how the world is and, and what society should look like. And any, any startup, any product company is made of dreams and ideas about the needs in society and, and what it could be like. But it's not just a one way street, the relationship between politics and technology. Politics is also technological. Just as the creation and change of technology is mediated by people <coughs> and power, our societal systems are mediated by technology. And that means that technology has an impact on how people in power are organized. <coughs> technology enables political change Societies are made up of networks of relationships which are enabled by communication. Technological change has revolutionized how we communicate, although the spread of technology is uneven and it's not always straightforward. Modes of communication enable different ways of negotiating the relationships within and between societies. This enables social, economic, and political change. Without technology, we can only communicate with those in our direct vicinity, although the skill of learning and transmitting oral history has proven an enduring way of passing knowledge and stories through time. Writing, 
allowed us to communicate to anyone with the ability to read what we write without the need for physical presence. Uh, in terms of looking at the political impact of writing, I highly recommend reading about Sequoia, a 19th century Cherokee man who learned that writing existed, didn't learn to write, invented a completely new uh, system of writing for the Cherokee language. Elders and other community members were initially hostile but, and suspected sorcery, but um, after he demonstrated the usefulness, uh, it was adopted enthusiastically across the Cherokee nation. And within five years, Cherokee literacy surpassed that of their white neighbors. Uh, the printing press allowed for one-to-many communication. There wasn't a, um, an icon for the printing press, so that's, <laughs> that's a printer. Um, but movable type was invented in China in the, 19th, in the uh, 11th century. It allowed for production of written communication much faster and much cheaper than manual transcription, allowing for far greater geographic reach. It was one of the factors that enabled the Reformation in the 16th century to cause such massive upheaval across Europe as it brought power away from the Catholic Church. The invention of the telegraph and the telephone in the 19th century <coughs> allowed for synchronous communication, uh, conversation ac across great distances, leading to a coordinated global society and all of the things that come along with globalism, like time zones. <laughs> back. <laughs> and the internet now allows for many-to-many -many conversation, where anyone with access to a connected device can participate in synchronous distributed <coughs> conversations, or asynchronous conversations as well. We're seeing massive shifts in society based on this. We're seeing shifts in power, in political power, in economic systems, in social systems. We're seeing shifts in the shapes and boundaries between societies and within societies, and the dust hasn't settled on exactly what the impact of that is going to be. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, a well-known international relations theorist who loves liberal democracy, he's a bit of a conservative. I thought that I was going too hard on the Marxism, so I'm just balancing it out. <laughs> uh, anyway, he's worried about uh, the future. Uh, his article, The Future of History, can liberal democracy survive the decline of the middle class is from 2012. So it's after the Arab Spring and before sort of Trump and Brexit and all of those things. He says, some very troubling economic and social trends, if they continue, will both threaten the stability of contemporary liberal democracies and dethrone democratic ideology as it is now understood. Every great advance for Silicon Valley likely means a loss of low-skilled jobs elsewhere in the economy, a trend that is unlikely to end anytime soon. So he, li he links advances in Silicon Valley with economic changes that increase inequality, with political changes that entrench disempowerment for the masses. And these views are somewhat backed up by a pattern of decline in freedom and democracy across the globe. Freedom House is an independent organization uh, from the United States that's produced annual reports about the state of democracy worldwide since 1973. In their 2017 report, they reported that every year since 2006, freedom has regressed in more countries than it has advanced. The Economist Intelligence, Intelligence Unit has produced a similar democracy index since 2006. It produces a score from one to 10 based on electoral process and pluralism, civil liberties, the functioning of government, political participation, and political culture. And it groups countries into one of authoritarian regime, hybrid regime, flawed democracy, or full democracy. In 2016, the US moved from full democracy to flawed democracy with a loss of trust in their public institutions. So according to The Economist as well, the ranks of full democracies are thinning. There are some bright spots, but the average score in every region fell between 2016 and 2017. More and more power 
is shifting away from governments and towards unelected, unaccountable institutions. Lots of governments are trying to snatch power back through censorship and repression. And lots of voters are disengaging with democratic processes that no longer feel like they have much impact. I think this is terrifying because from my perspective, democracy is good and authoritarianism is not great. <laughs> but maybe not all of you think that. Maybe some of you are from Hobbesian memes for authoritarian teams. <laughs> so what does this all mean for you? Why is this relevant to you? Why are you getting this lecture in the middle of a con oh, the end of a conference about Ruby? First of all, because we're not just technologists. We're part of technology communities. And the people and, and power within those communities are organized in specific ways. We have workplaces. We're on mailing lists. We're in community Slack channels. We make pull requests. We maintain libraries. We use open source technologies where power, control, and access are organized in particular ways. The communities that support our technologies are political. We make choices about how to organize people in power, and those choices determine what gets built and distributed and what doesn't. The things that get built are based on someone's flawed, leaky abstractions of the present. They're based on political ideas about how the world is and how it should be. Do we know what those ideas are? Do we know what we're working towards? It's not enough to just say that we're working to change the world or that we're making things better. Whose version of better is it? Who is it better for? As Deleuze says, technology is social before it is physical. The technology that we build has poli political ramifications even when we don't mean to do anything political. The technology that we build can change the society that we live in, which can result in shifts to the way that people in power are organized. In a recent Vanity Fair article that many of you will have seen, it was argued that Twitter was unable to address the harassment and abuse on their platform because of its early, use, uh, early choice to use Ruby on Rails. <laughs> It's obviously ridiculous to blame Ruby on Rails for Twitter's abuse problem, but it remains that people like us built Twitter using technologies like what we use. Would we have done it the same, given the same constraints? We now know that Twitter has also been used by repressive governments to astroturf, simulating broad support for them and widespread criticism for their opponents and detractors and creating smoke screens around bad news. As far as I know, the people who built these platforms envisioned the democratization of media, not its co-option by corrupt governments. Is there a technical solution to that? What changes are we making with the work that we do? None of us can predict the future. Our best guesses are based on our imperfect abstractions of how the world is now and how it's behaved in the past. What kind of future are we building? Are we going into it with our eyes open? Many of us are specifically driven by technology's potential for societal change. We are powerful actors in shaping the world. We know this. We love this. We love to disrupt this or revolutionize that. But revolutions don't always go well. And revolutions harm some sector of the population by definition. If we're in the business of revolutionizing, we should at least be thinking about who it is that we're harming. What do you think that the world is like? How does that impact the technology that you build? How does it relate to the communities that you're in? The political ideas that we hold in our communities, the range of views that we tolerate in our communities, they're significant. If we have monocultures and never question the ideas held by our communities, 
we build stuff that serves the interest only of that group. We have so much power <coughs> and impact on how the world works. It's important that we don't base our conception of it on convincing tweets that we saw one time. <laughs> this is a call to be conscious about our perspectives, being aware of what they are, where they've come from, why we hold them, being critical as to whether they're useful abstractions of the world. It's a call to be thoughtful about the impacts that our work has on the world. It's a call to engage with insights from others. Because one way or another, we're building the future. What do you think the world should be like? Maybe we can make that happen.